I'm going to talk about biomimetics, and uh, you've heard this term used already, so I won't try and define it. Some of the famous ones are the lotus leaf, uh, the gecko foot, uh, the burdock plant, which uh, famously led to the invention of Velcro, because um, the, the person whose name I've forgotten now, uh, the inventor, um, was going on a walk and he noticed that these burdock uh, seeds were gripping his clothing with hooks and it led to the invention of Velcro, which we're using virtually all the time and it was used by the American forces, I believe, during the war or at least just after the war. And that's what really led to it taking off. I'll mention the right flyer in a moment. Birds are certainly an example of this. The bombardier beetle will come in to this talk and another one which I'm fascinated by is the walking cellular machine, which is kinesin, right down at the molecular level. So we'll get to some of these as we move on. I just want to describe some of the famous ones. I'm not going to actually go into detail on them, but they are examples just to whet your appetite a bit more. And the gecko lizard is absolutely amazing because it's got tiny little hairs which get smaller and smaller and smaller until they become what we call seta, or setai, if you're going to be exact for the plural. Uh, seta is an individual one. And what happens is that they produce van der Waals forces right down at the very, very small level. And as it says, these seta can deform to make intimate contact with even very rough surfaces resulting in millions of contact points that each are able to carry a small load. So they can walk up walls, obviously, and walk on the roof without any difficulty whatsoever. And that's led to robots uh, copying the idea of the gecko lizard. Another example is the lotus leaf, which has inspired uh, self-cleaning glass, although it's still rather expensive. But the whole point is that uh, if you've got a very furry um, or, or a very uh, a surface which is actually right down at the microscopic level, rather rough, then the water doesn't just spread out and wet the surface. It actually forms little globules. And this little diagram shows it on the left. as It's a schematic showing a hydrophilic surface with water contact angle at the top, less than 90 degrees. So that's wetting, that's uh, wetting the surface there. But then the next one, the contact angle um, is greater than 90 degrees. So it's no longer wetting properly. Then there are super hydrophobic surfaces where the water contact angle is larger than 150 degrees. And that can happen. And so there's a whole paper on this if you want to read it in molecules where it's entitled Supra Hydrophobic Surfaces Developed by Mimicking high Hierarchical Surface Morphology of a Lotus Leaf. Now, I'm not going to major on these introductory ones, but I will just say a little bit more about flight um, a bit later, because uh, that really fascinates me. And uh, the aerodynamic excellence of birds, of course, was something that the Wright brothers, which I will mention in a moment, copied. And the one which I know that some of you would like me to talk about a little bit, and I will talk about it a little bit, but I won't go into all the, all the issues of, of it in this talk. I, uh, I have done a whole talk on the Bombardier Beetle, and I think it's stored somewhere in the ELF archives. Um, you will find my talk, I think, on the Bombardier Beetle. But we're talking about biomimetics and we're seeking to learn design from creation to inspire innovative engineering. And of course that has implications to design and I just need to touch on an area where I think if we as uh, Christian believers are not aware of it, we can fall into a trap. Because those who will argue against us will say, well, you're just believing in a God of the gaps, aren't you? If you can't explain it, God must have done it. And you need to be aware of that. Now, my answer to that is that it's not what we do not know which is causing me to say this is an example 
of a mind behind it. It is what we do know, it's that which points to design. And of course, the key verse that was mentioned by, uh, by Thomas Schmidt in the first talk is Romans 1.20. The invisible things of God, him, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That verse has to stand. So if we believe the Bible, then it must be possible to use this carefully as an apologetic argument. And of course, there's another verse in Colossians chapter 1, which says, and I love this set of scriptures, um, it's really 16 to 18 here, I've added verse 18, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible, invisible, whether there be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he, the Lord Jesus, is before all things, and by him all things consist. So it's not just creation. By him everything, as it says in Hebrews 1 verse 3, is upheld by the word of his power. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And I've asked Juliet, if I die first, that she puts this as my epitaph, that in all things he, Christ, might have the preeminence. So that is my motto, that in all things, he, the Lord Jesus Christ, should have the preeminence. And that's what's eventually going to happen, as was mentioned by Conrad this morning. We may have different views about quite exactly what's going to happen at the end, but we know that Christ is returning and that in all things, he will be seen to be king. There are weaknesses in the design argument. We just need to be aware that, uh, I'm aware that we will have different perspectives and I'm not trying to raise the arguments about different positions, but uh, we all believe in creation and we all could fall foul of a design argument where we're not aware of what the opposing groups will say. And one thing is that we don't believe that God, well, at least I don't believe, in a fixity of species. So he made the canine kind, the dog kind, but he didn't make a Labrador in the beginning. A Labrador uh, and uh, a Chihuahua look totally different, but actually they're all descendants of dogs. Okay, so we need to be aware of that. The other thing to be aware of is that the world is not what it was. Now, we all believe in the fall, that there was a terrible effect of the fall of man in the beginning. And of course, there is also the flood as well, the worldwide flood, which had a dramatic effect on the way the world is. And that means that there are things like predator-prey relationships. Bombardier beetle is definitely one of them. You know, it's blasting. Uh, Alex was talking to me after, uh, just now and say to me, well, what was the bombardier beetle doing before the fall? Nobody knows, but it may have been using its squirting ability to soften up some sort of fruit, and it wasn't originally trying to use it, you know, to blast at a wolf spider, which was trying to eat it. We just do not know what was going on before the fall. But we just need to be prepared for those sorts of arguments if you're going to be using a design argument in apologetics. A lot of that's in my book, Genesis for Today, which is gone now. But there's another book here, Genesis 1 to 11, which I wrote, which is a commentary on, on the, um, the issue of uh, how we understand the text. Uh, and then um, there is another book here, which I'll just mention, seeing as I'm talking about books. That one is, what did I say, five euros for that. This one is 15 euros. Okay, and that's a book that I wrote with Wonders of Creation with Stuart Burgess. This is a new book just come out, which, and there's only one copy of it left by the looks of it. Ola Husha, is it? Or Ola Husha, it's got an umlaut on it. Uh, he has edited this book and he has written a chapter on it. There is other chapters. I've got a chapter on thermodynamics somewhere, chapter four. Uh, Ola Hustcher in the introduction. He's written the introduction to it. There is a theologian who has written in it. The cosmology, 
chapter is written by Russ Humphreys. Um, Taz Walker has done a chapter on the geology. And there's a lot of other chapters. Stuart Burgess has done a chapter as well on mechanical engineering. Uh, and my chapter's on thermodynamics. So um, you might like to pick up that last copy. And then that, that book, by the way, is 10 euros. This is one euro. It's a tract, really, or a booklet to give to those who think that they're atheists and that they can demolish the Christian position. Well, I'm not saying this is a magic bullet, but it does put a constructive argument against that. And then there's this, if you cut, feel that you can't buy this big book, this is a summary book of that big book written by Stuart Burgess and myself, and that's just two euros. And it's got a few classic examples of the arguments on creation. There's a summary of birds and it talks about the hummingbird uh, which is my chapter. So have a look at that afterwards if you would like to use them. So obviously the gospel is the answer to what we just said. And David Attenborough uh, famously was written to by a Christian once saying, well, why don't you believe in creation? Seeing as you talk about all these wonderful creatures that have been made, you think by evolution, why don't you believe in creation? And he, he wrote back very courteously, uh, Mom, you know, or wh whoever it was, it may have been a, a fellow, who, but whoever it was, he said, uh, look, I can't believe in a God who makes uh, little um, parasites eat out children's eyes in Africa, which was a very valid answer. In fact, Darwin said a very similar point in his day. How can I believe in a good God when... Uh, killer whales, and you can see them doing it on the films, play with seal pups before they eat them. You know, it's ghastly. And of course, the answer is the gospel, that the world was not originally made like it is now. And of course, you've got to be prepared for that argument and courteously say, well, the world isn't the same as it was when it was created. So on to the issue of design and using that argument with those caveats that you have in mind as to what people might say in return, um, we're thinking mainly of the inspiration that nature creation can give for design. And indeed, in the created world, there is what I would call smart design. It's not just design, it's a design involving interwoven complexity. We call that sometimes, Mike Behe cornered this phrase, or coined this phrase, irreducible complexity. That is, nothing will work unless everything is working. There are interdependent components which all need each other to operate. Nothing works unless everything works, is a catchphrase which effectively summarizes that. Boeing hit a problem, didn't they, some years ago with the Boeing um, uh, 737 MAX, I've now flown on one. I was a little bit terrified when I went on it, but it did work. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't have been here to tell the story. But sadly, of course, hundreds died in the two major accidents which took place. One was in Ethiopia, if I remember rightly, and the other one was in Indonesia. And the whole problem was that Boeing had rather cut corners, at least that's the way I interpret it, that there was a, a little vein here on one side, which was measuring the airflow, but really you needed one on the other side as well to be sure that you were really measuring the true angle of attack. And that was being fed into a computer, which said, um, uh, or would give a wrong reading and say that uh, you're too, you're going to stall, you're going to stall, pull up, pull up, pull up. And of course it was, it, it, it was an impossible position to be in because the pilot needs to have the final control. And of course, it was telling, sorry, it was the other way around. It was saying that you're too high an angle of attack and it was trying to pull the, push the nose down, whereas he was trying to fight the controls and pull the nose up. And of course, the computer was actually wrong because the pilot was right and he was fighting the controls to pull the nose up, but it was constantly being pushed down until eventually he couldn't compete any longer and the aircraft, both aircraft went straight into the ground with everybody dying. 
Now, what was the reason for that? Well, because there was, they were wrongly, sent, the sensors were incorrect, and of course, the system needed to only advise and not force the pilot to do that which they knew was incorrect. So there was two issues, and uh, they had to learn the hard way, and I, it's gone through all the courts and everything. Very sad story, of course. But so coming back to living systems, I'm not going to talk about the leaf, but actually that's an example of a, an amazing system um, with photosynthesis. But there are interconnected, interdependent systems. And they're not all at the same level. So there could be an outer sensor, which is sensing, as we were mentioning earlier, could be an epigenetic system where you're sensing the environment. And that feeds into uh, a system at the higher level, the phenotype level, if you might say, and might feed down to even the genetic level, but certainly down to the molecular level. So you have layered systems. Your smartphone is a little bit like this. It's only a poor copy, really, of what I'm trying to say. But clearly, when I open my smartphone and I have to type in a password, that's an immediate interaction with the outside world, which is me, right? And it's say, what do you want to do? And it's basically giving you all sorts of possibilities for interaction. So this is, if you like, a sensor, which it literally is on the surface, feeding into uh, sub-units, which will then go and do what you ask them to do. So it's interfaced with internal, external inputs and the environment. And involved in smart design is sensing, actuation, and control. I'm going to give you five examples. I said I'd do one on flight, which I will do. And these are the other ones. We'll do something on flight, a little bit on dragonflies, molecular motors, which is absolutely fascinating in the cell, even intermeshing gears right down at the microscopic level. And the last one will be on the bombardier beetle, and in particular, it's hydrogen peroxide production, which is something which I'm fascinated by. So first of all, on flight, I think you know who these two gentlemen are. Wilbur uh, is on the right and Orville is on the left. Orville is the one with a very fancy moustache, you know, and uh, he was the front man, really. Wilbur was the, the one who probably had more of the research mentality. And it was between those two, uh, here they are walking to work with their bowler hats on, and their wonderful wind tunnel experiments that they did, which is one of the first examples of doing wind tunnel work, that um, they, they realized by looking at the birds, particularly Wilbur, they could see that they were curving their wings, changing the shape of their wings, and the idea came to Wilbur's mind, especially that if he could actually construct some material over a framework and, bend and change its shape, he could then change the lift on one side or both sides of the first uh, aeroplane, powered aeroplane, which they made. The top picture is of the glider that they tested for many months beforehand. And the front is here, actually, not there. The front is this bit. We normally now put the horizontal surfaces, extra surfaces at the back, but they put them at the front. And this is looking from behind. The first flight was actually with Orville on it, and Wilbur is looking very jittery here, watching to see whether it's going to work. And of course it did work. There was bumps and they, they ended up nose up at the end of that day. But it was an incredible day, December the 17th, 1903. I've not yet been to Kitty Hawk in North Carolina, but I hope to go sometime and actually see there's a memorial there to the first flight, which was a little bit longer than the Boeing 747 length, if I remember rightly. So it was not a very long flight, but it was a controlled flight. And by the end of the day, they'd flown much further. And of course, they were looking at the birds. Here's a white-tailed eagle with this beautifully curved aerofoil shape. And of course, the lift is produced by that shape. And you've got to have lift on two wings, and you've got to have the lift on the tail as well in order to get 
that bird able to control its flight. And that's not the end of the story. It's got to have extra surfaces, and I'll mention the winglets here in a moment, which recently, well, in the last 20 years now, have been copied. Uh, but these winglets are not un unimportant. But the main thing, of course, is the aerofoil shape here. I always used to tell my students when I was lecturing that lift is, can be obtained by any mechanism you wish. As long as you bend the flow, then you'll always get a reactionary force. It's Newton's third law. That it doesn't matter how you do it. It doesn't have to be Bernoulli's curved principles. That, that is not the essence of it. You could you get an electromagnet and charge the, the uh, you could have air being somehow charged, carrying charge on it, and you could bend the flow, and then there would be a force on the magnet, wouldn't there? Which would be an equal and opposite reactionary force. So in the end, you've got to, have, we call it circulation in aerodynamic terms. You're causing the air to bend. And once you do that, you get a force on the wing. Well, of course, birds have an amazing structure, and the, the structure is actually of feathers here. Uh, sorry, their wings, I should say, are made of feathers, and every feather has to be in exactly the right place. No feather is exactly the same on a bird. So any one feather on a bird is never the same as any other feather on that same bird. And it applies right down to tiny little hummingbirds, as well as big birds like the white-tailed eagle that I showed earlier. And as you look on the wing, the primary feathers are on the outside. These are the ones that you might clip in order to stop the bird from flying for a while while you train it. It's not cruel because the keratin is not felt anymore as it's, it's just an appendage. Uh, but those feathers then regrow or they grow again through, uh, I, I can't go into all the detail here, but there is a special tube that they come out of being placed in exactly the right, right position. As you move inwards, you have the covert feathers and then the greater coverts and then the medium coverts and so on. And as you go back, you've got primary feathers there, primary coverts and greater coverts, even as you go forwards. So you're actually creating a thickening of the wing, which is very important, near the front, and also uh, thicker near the inboard uh, position, which is exactly what we do with wings on aircraft today. And of course, those, those wings which we normally think made of metal today or made of wood in the past, for birds, they're made of feathers. And the feathers have to be rightly positioned, not only looking down on that cross, that uh, plan form, diagram that I just showed you, but they've got to be in the right position to make the aerofoil shape, which you saw uh, in, the, in the earlier picture of the white-tailed eagle with that beautifully aerodynamically formed surface, uh, which I saw, this was in the Isle of Mull when I uh, took this picture. And it just marvelously shows this aerofoil shape that is made by feathers. Actually, even a feather just on its own is a marvel of lightweight engineering because just one feather, this is a starling feather, and we get hundreds of starlings where I live, and uh, they, they, are, they are sort of the, the, we have bird feeders out and they just will demolish anything that's there very quickly. They're really, um, they're like the uh, teenagers, you know, that are always stuffing themselves. Anyway, they, they actually have a beautiful sheen in the summer, which is shown on this uh, secondary feather of a starling. So it's slightly curved, but not curved as much as the primary. But looking at the feather itself, this is the rachis, right, which is the main, uh, main stem. So this is the rachis here in the diagram. And here are barbs coming out of the uh, rachis. And what is a marvel of engineering, when I realized this, that you only see this under the microscope, but the right-handed barbules, which is what these are, these barbules on the right 
have ridges on, which is this here, right? And the left-handed barbules have hooks on. So adjacent barbs are held together by the hooks of one side, which on the left, gripping the ridges on uh, for right-handed barbules coming out from an adjacent barb. That is an incredible system. And that is so light, it's made of keratin, but again, to any engineer, it immediately shows that this cannot have come about by random mutations. It has to be there for any wing surface made of that material to work. You can't have a frayed scale, which by the way, grows from a different position in the skins, it grows, a scale is near the surface, whereas a feather grows from uh, uh, a follicle, just like the hair that I used to have here uh, grows from a follicle. <laughs> the feathers grow from a follicle, uh, and which looks a bit like a, uh, you know, a, a pen, a pen uh, casing, and it grows in there. It's very, very thin, and then it disintegrates once it's in position. It's an amazing system, and that's an actual picture of this hook and ridge system on a feather. So a feather is an amazing example of engineering, uh, even before you get to wings. And although I don't accept the dates here, this is supposedly 99 million years old, I don't believe that for a moment, but we'll leave the matter of dating. But even if it were, what it shows is that this feather trapped in amber or resin originally from a tree um, has actually got, shows exactly the same structure as we have in feathers today. Flight needs control and uh, you look at uh, a typical wing on an aircraft today, slats at the front, flaps at the left, on, an air, uh, on, on the right, sorry, of this Airbus A310. Do birds have that system? Actually, they do. But they do it in a much better way than we do it. They actually do it, as I've already said, by having muscles which change the whole shape of the wing. And indeed, Wilbur Wright was trying to do exactly what the birds do by having ropes which you pulled and actually changed the whole camber of the left-hand wing separate to the right-hand wing. So that would cause a roll, or depending which one was carrying the greater lift, it would actually cause a roll to the right or a roll to the left. And if you did it together, it would increase the lift at that particular speed. And so they knew, Wilbur and Orville, that the secret was in actually understanding control. This picture also, of course, shows that the curved wings at the end, which we call winglets, are very necessary on these big birds of prey because when they come in to land, it requires an awful lot of energy to keep them aloft at low speed. But even though you're increasing the drag, it's worth it because it, as you slow down, the drag is not quite so crucial and you need extra lift. But this reduces the induced drag and the fuel penalty for aircraft is much less when you're coming in on the long approaches, which most aircraft make, usually 100 miles out before they start descending, um, then you have these winglets at the end, which reduces the fuel usage at low speed. And here's another bird of prey, uh, an owl showing the same curved winglets. But interestingly, all birds have alula feathers. The alula feathers are similar to these slats. The flaps, if you like, are for changing the overall wing surface. And of course, there is yet another control surface, which is out here, which is not the flap, but is usually, it may be inboard on this wing. But um, you have uh, ailerons, which go in the opposite direction, depending whether you're going, uh, rolling to the right or to the left. So alula feathers are like slats. They operate under low speed again, and they change the wing surface at the front, and what they do is they avoid the air separating from the wing surface at low speed. Because as you go to low speed, you get actually separation if you're not careful. 
So both the use of an alula, which is a slat at the front here, or you can have what's called eddy flaps, which is yet another feature that some birds have. This brown skewer shows lifted covert feathers, which passively lift when the air pressure is getting so low on the top that it's going to actually separate off. And so in order to avoid the separation, these covert feathers lift, which keeps the air attached over the top surface. So they're very important. So just summarizing flight, feathers are necessary to have that uh, hook and ridge structure. Wings must be well constructed, as I was mentioning. The tail, you, I haven't talked about the tail, but you must have a tail as well. And you've got to have the ability to change the camber, the flaps, the winglets, the alula feathers, the eddy flaps. I hadn't time to talk to you about the breathing of birds, which is in the main uh, a very different system for breathing. Um, they have uh, continually flowing, uh, they have air continually flowing through their lungs, which is not like our system, which brings the air to a dead stop. And that's very important for their, um, their air storage, which is, some of it is stored in the hollow bone structure of birds. Let me move on to my second example, which is flight control in dragonflies. I don't know whether you've ever noticed, but dragonflies have an amazing structure, which is so delicate, and yet it works. Their wings are made of membranes spread over a lattice of veins. And have you, have you ever noticed these four spots on a dragonfly wing? It's not the only note of interest, but I'll just tell you a little bit about them. They are called pterostigma. And what they are is extra weights deliberately put there. It's just slightly denser material. So it's, a, it's slightly bending the wing down. And the reason it's important is because imagine this bit of paper, put it into a wind tunnel. What would happen if the wind went over it? It would just, it would just flutter. And flutter is a real problem when aircraft were being designed, particularly in the 40s and 50s after the Second World War. We were building faster and faster airplanes and we were, you know, trying to beat everybody else and everybody was in competition with one another. And uh, that applied to the English aircraft industry. And you probably heard of the Comet. Uh, it had metal fatigue problems and it broke up in midair. Other aircraft, though, suffered from flutter due to the wings not being strong enough for a condition which nobody realized could happen. That is that if you get resonance with the wind, the, the, the wing can then just uncontrollably vibrate. It's been found that the wings of dragonflies, which are so thin, without these pterostigma would just vibrate uncontrollably. So what mindless mutation decided that there should be a weight just of slightly denser material put in exactly the right position to bend the wing, not only downwards, but to also cause the wing to be more aerodynamically shaped at this point in the main wing. You imagine, you see it curves the wing over a bit. That's in exactly the right place, and it stops the wing from fluttering. And these, uh, these uh, amazing flying machines can fly at 25 miles an hour, which is what, about uh, somewhere in the region of 40, 30, 35, 40 kilometers an hour. So they're pretty powerful beasties. Uh, there's a few birds which can catch them midair, but not many. And they also have separate muscles controlling each wing, a muscle for pulling the wing down and a muscle for pulling the wing up. That's very different to the fly you swatted the other day, which are marvelous in their own right, but frankly, we don't really like the house flies because they, they build, put their grubs, their eggs into 
rotten food, as is well known, so you don't particularly want that. But they are amazing dragonflies because they fly much faster because of this wing movement. They also can operate both wings independently. And if I just do the motion for one side of a dragonfly, in normal fast cruise, this is what's happening. And you'll notice if this is the leading edge, the first wing, this is the second wing, this is what's happening. They are rotating their wings like this. And that motion is incredibly uh, aerodynamically powerful because they, they are always getting lift, even on the upstroke. This is what uh, this paper by Dickinson shows. Um, the, the red is the lift. The black is the position of the wing. And they're always getting lift by doing this motion, even on the upstroke. So it's a very clever system. Nobody's ever, at the moment, as far as I know, built a drone which completely copies what a dragonfly does. Because it would require too much weight for the control system in order to make sure that the wings operated properly. Most drones there are some drones which copy the flapping motion, but not, as far as I know, there's no drone yet which copies this motion, which really gives it speed. And it's an incredible system. But it's not only that. Did you know that dragonflies, of course, most of you probably do know, that dragonflies are an example of metamorphosis, which itself, I've never yet found any evolutionist tell me what was the origin of metamorphosis itself. They will always say the change in two body plans is to do with Hox genes, which I don't deny, I'm sure that's relevant. I'm not a geneticist, but I understand the genome has what's called Hox genes, which are to do with body plans. And they will say, yeah, it's in that area. But that's fine, but that's not telling me where did the whole idea that the second body plan lays the eggs for the first body plan. And that, of course, must have happened straight away for any creature to survive, because if you couldn't reproduce yourself, you've lost, you've lost the game, guys, in the so-called evolutionary race to propagate. You know, if you can't propagate, that's the end of it. So any metamorphosis is an issue. But what beats me, or what gets me, and what really thrills me is that the dragonfly starts off not in air. It doesn't start off as a caterpillar or an egg going into a caterpillar. It starts off as an egg becoming a nymph, which has gills in water. And when it comes out, as this picture shows from David Attenborough's BBC video, Life in the Undergrowth, which is well worth watching, you can actually see the spiracles are being made by pulling uh, white strands out in order to make the holes for that creature, the dragonfly, to breathe. So that would take too much time to go into that in great detail, but please do consider these issues. So I'm saying there is a biomimetic uh, possibility here. I've talked about people making drones which actually copy the flapping motion. They've got that far, but they haven't made drones yet which will copy the twisting motion of the wings. We need a control system which is able to do that. So um, I need to hurry on because I want to show you some a video and I want to have time to do it. But you can see they're listed the issues that we need to consider. All these are working together. It's an example of irreducible complexity. If the terror stigma weren't there, that's the end of it, guys. If the scales were not positioned as they should be, that would be in the end of the possibility of this creature, as it were, emerging from some, whatever creature you're going to say it might have evolved from. So there are arguments here which are very important. And I think the biggest argument is metamorphosis itself. Molecular motors, let's come to that as the third example. Molecular motors, one example of them is the ATP synthase motor, which makes ADP into ATP. I'm, uh, I'm bow to others who know more on biochemistry than I do, but I understand this is adenosine diphosphate, 
plus an inorganic phosphate being added to it, making ATP, which is a very unstable but very necessary molecule. That is called the energy molecule of the cell, and in its own right, it's irreducibly complex. Other people have talked about this because it has a motor, and it has to have, uh, it, it, there are many of them in the cell, billions of them, frankly, uh, and it's, it's got to have a proton gradient going across that membrane, and the actual motion of the, uh, of the motor is actually producing the, what, the, the power, which is expressed of, by the uh, inorganic phosphate, uh, sorry, by the, um, the, the hydrogen uh, atom going across, the hydrogen gradient, that actually drives the motor which then produces the, um, the inorganic phosphate to change the ADP into ATP. And just another point on this, I want you to watch this video. I think it's just incredible because this raises energy issues. And I've just written a paper actually on the energy issues in DNA. The polymerization of DNA actually shouts that there is a massive uh, energy issue, what we call a free energy in a lot of the molecular bonds in molecular systems right down at the, the um, right down at the uh, uh, genotype level uh, such as DNA, the rungs on the DNA, those bonds are actually in what we call positive energy. They, 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 have, they, they won't naturally come together, they have to be put together and then they are held together, but there needs to be energy to draw them together. Now, the energy comes actually from ATP in the polymerization of DNA. But ATP, as you'll see in a moment, is used for many processes. Now, just watch this video with me. Here's the paradox. The cell needs to make ADP, the empty batteries of life, before they can be charged up to ATP and put to use. But producing one new empty battery requires at least seven already charged batteries. So you can't make ADP until you already have ATP around in the cell. And ATP is required to build ATP synthase. But ATP synthase is required to charge ADP into ATP. So life's energy harnessing process is one big paradox. You need it before you can have it and you can't make it until you've already made it. Every part had to arrive, assemble, and start working all at once, leaving no time for it to gradually develop. Watch that video in your own time. And it's at uh, the Discovery Institute list of long story short videos. And they've got a whole list of them. And they are very well worth watching because they're put in a way which most students will say, yeah, that's, the, that's what I need. I just need a few, um, few words just to tell me what's going on, a few diagrams. And as I've indicated here, there are thermodynamic implications. But let, I'm still on this issue of the, um, the, the molecular level, the bio, biochemistry. Um, I've been always fascinated by locomotion and particularly old steam trains. Steam trains run on rails. As Wallace and Gromit found out, in their film. You thought that could never happen and it's only just in children's videos. It does happen, but not quite exactly like that. The kinesin is a walking molecule. Meet the kinesin. Masterpieces of microengineering. Kinesins are miniature motorized machines that carry cargo from one part of the cell to another. Walking along self-assembling highways called microtubules. Known as the workhorses of the cell, kinesins have two feet, or globular heads, that literally walk one foot over another along the microtubule, pulling their cargo to its destination. Each foot possesses two special locations, called binding sites, that interact with other molecules. One site attaches to the microtubule, and the other binds with ATP, the energy molecule of the cell. When one foot binds with ATP and uses its energy, 
the foot flips over, resulting in the walking motion. So the walking motion is provided by ATP and this is a most interesting subadynamic issue because they are actually, these are the binding sites marked beta and these are the two legs, green and blue. And this is an ADP which um, with, uh, with the ATP coming along, right, uh, or, or the tri triphosphate, the, the, the phosphate molecule given out or pulse, uh, phosphate extra is given out and it causes the binding then on that particular site. This then causes a turning motion and the diphosphate then has to swivel in order to, to be in the right place, which then causes this to, to take place. So that, that now has come on to the beta, which is shown here. And then finally, there is the release of an in, inorganic phosphate. What was a triphosphate now becomes a diphosphate. And that is what's constantly going on, summarized here by hydrolysis as well as ADP release, changing the orientation of the protein. This is a thermodynamic marvel, and I don't think anybody has yet studied this from an energy point of view. And it's one of my aims to perhaps eventually begin to write something on that. But this, this idea of a walking molecule, I'm sure will be something that James Tour in his wonderful work at Rice University, uh, where he talks about synthesizing molecules which are copying that which is in nature. He deals with synthetic biochemistry. He's on a different planet to me in terms of his brilliance. But he and others are seeking to copy what's happening at the biomolecular level. So that system only works when many things are working together and interacting systems need control. And as I've already indicated to you, ATP left to itself is unstable. It wants to give off that inorganic phosphate. And it leads then to the ATP binding, the ATP ADP release to make kinesin twist and walk. You need the microtubules, which were not built by Gromit himself. On the film, Gromit was building them. This is not built by the kinesin itself, it's built um, by other systems working alongside the cargo molecule walking along. And the rails are being built as it goes along. That's where Wallace and Gromit actually did get it right. Um, the thermodynamic stepping needs studying and the connecting rope to the cargo is, is a marvel in its own right. Let me give you two last examples and then I'm through. Intermeshing gears. Now, this astonished the person who discovered them. And you can see his astonishment as I play this little video clip of him. Uh, just, uh, I forget the name of the gentleman now. David Burroughs, that's right, from the University of Cambridge. Ten years ago, he discovered the plant hopper Isis. And he discovered that it had gears. Just Hear the astonishment in his voice as he describes it. Well, we've discovered gears in an insect. Mechanically interacting gears are always thought of as a man-made invention used in our bikes and our cars. But what we've shown is that a small plant-sucking bug evolved gears long, long ago and uses these gears to mechanically synchronize the very rapid jumping movements of its legs this is the first demonstration of interacting gears being used by any animal. The jump is really very rapid indeed. It takes off at a velocity of about five meters per second. That's equivalent to about 12 miles per hour. And it accelerates in less than a millisecond. So it experiences enormous g-forces as it takes off, about 500 or even 700 g. I first became aware of these bugs when I was in the garden of my friend and colleague Peter Brownig in Aachen in Germany. He has a quite wild garden with lots of ivy growing all over the place. They're a very specific sort of bug. They only like to eat ivy. And so I spent a huge amount of time trying to look on all the ivy bushes in Cambridge for these bugs and couldn't find them. 
Then my five-year-old grandson, Max, came to the rescue. He found these bugs in his garden. And he rushed up to me one day and said, Grandad, I found these plant hoppers in my garden. Here they are. And so we brought them back to the lab here in Cambridge. And that's when I did the experiment of showing that the cogwheels were actually engaging with each other. The high speed images that we have to take of these bugs to reveal these very brief events takes us into a completely different world. So that's the picture that he showed on the film of these gears. And here's the pictures from the paper, which you can see. And what is absolutely amazing is this picture. You can actually see that it's not crude gears. They are specially shaped to go into one another. Everything is indicating clever, clever, smart design. And another example which is similar, because it involves cogs and gears, is the famous bacterial flagellum, which was denied by Kenneth Miller at the Dover trial in 2005, uh, 2005 as being evidence of design. He argued that it came from the, or came through an evolutionary process through the type three secretory system, which was a sort of halfway house but the type three secretory system, uh, as described by Scott Minnick, if you look up the response, which was written sometime later in 2013, you can find it in the literature, Scott Minnick and Mike Behe responded to that. And they argued that the type three secretory system, yes, it has some features which overlap, but no way is it a primitive example. It itself is very different and irreducibly complex. So, uh, and to cap it all, the bacterial flagellum is put in the shade by another finding of a flagellum which has seven tails and 24 interlocking gears. The seven tails, the flagella, rotate one way and the smaller gears rotate in the opposite direction to maximize the torque while minimizing the friction. It's well known with helicopters that you cannot just have this uh, great big rotor going around without something else balancing it. Of course, you have a tail which, it, which is pushing in the other direction to stop the whole body swinging around with the rotor. If you knock the tail off, that's what will happen. You've got some famous accidents and that has happened. So, but a helicopter has three engines, uh, essentially, but, and a multiple gearbox. But this system in nature has never yet been copied. It's the prokaryote bacterium, and it has seven, uh, seven flagella and 24 intermeshing rotors. So it looks a bit like this little video. So you've got the seven rotors, which are coming out here with the flagella, and then you've got these other rotors going round in the opposite direction. And of course, it's happening quite fast. Well, I promised you that I'd do a little bit on the Bombardier Beetle. And I'm especially working on the hydrogen peroxide production. And I've got some discussions going on, as is well known, by the Germans here with Boris Schmidtgal and others. And uh, we're looking to see whether we can actually put a, a group together to actually work on this. The Bombardier Beetle, in case you're not aware, actually does an amazing action in order to uh, try and blast against its pre predator. Few creatures will risk annoying a Bombardier Beetle. It mixes a cocktail of deadly chemicals in a special chamber. They react and explode at boiling point from its rear end in an awesome chemical weapon. And uh, the initial experiments were done by Professor Tom Eisner, who's now died, and he was a, he was a great biologist, real practical gentleman, and he wrote the book For the Love of Insects, and it's one of my treasured books on my bookshelf, because he's inscribed it, and he's drawn a little bombardier beetle in it as well. So I had great fun talking to him over in Cornell, I visited him a few times. And here's him in, in, uh, in an earlier, quite, quite a number of decades ago now, um, talking about the Bombardier Beetle. 
One of the really amazing things about this animal is its ability to spray in a very beautifully aimed fashion. And that shows up very nicely when you put the animal on indicator paper. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pinch very lightly one leg after the other, just as if I were an ant biting these legs. I'm going to start with the right hind leg. right front leg left front leg at 400 frames per second the action has been slowed down but not enough to see the individual pulses so they went to a lab and filmed the beetle at an even faster speed, at an incredible 4,000 frames a second. Oh. <laughs> there were the pulses, each one corresponding to the individual bursts of sound. So we, we looked at this system and uh, with help from Professor Eisner's electron micrographs, we were able to actually understand that there was a valve system here. This is, you can't see it, but this is the inlet going in here and the exhaust is here and there's a little membrane which actually is pushed up when uh, the blast is coming out. And all this is happening as a separate system to its uh, uh, digestive tract, so it's not sort of passing air after a big meal, as some people might have thought. Um, so how does it work? Well, it works by two valves, and uh, Tom Eisner had discovered the, uh, the first valve, and Schildknecht had also understood a lot of the chemistry, uh, and they knew each other. Uh, and Tom Eisner had discovered the pinching mechanism of the inlet valve, so that closes the inlet when you're under pressure. But what became apparent as we discussed it together between myself and Tom Eisner was that there was an exhaust valve as well. And this is the exhaust valve looking end on, the membrane is lifted up. So I, I haven't time to describe all the detail of what we have done already, but we built uh, a 20 times size chamber to the bombardier beetle chamber, which is about one millimeter. And we actually got a system working where we were heating, not, not with chemistry, but we were heating electrically. And that then became uh, better prototypes where we were able to increase the frequency and we were able to apply this especially to engines where we wanted to put additives into internal combustion engines. But what's really interesting me is the chemistry. I feel that we've done enough on the valve system, but what I really would like to do is to try and understand the chemistry. Schildknecht, as I say, did an awful lot of work on this to begin with. Tom Eisner wasn't a chemist, but he certainly understood the main issues. Dawkins claimed that he understood what the bombardier beetle was doing, by the way. Uh, you'll have to look at some of my papers to look at the way I discussed Dawkins, who did a famous talk in 1991 to all the youngsters in uh, the Royal Institution in London and claimed that you don't need the hydro, you don't need to bother about the hydroquinone. Actually, you do, because that, once that breaks down, that's an endothermic reaction. It needs heat putting in, hence the plus, in order to produce the hydrogen. And once you've got the hydrogen, then that will combine with the oxygen, which is released. Definitely, yes, that's exothermic, but not big time exothermic. Once you get this reaction going, then it becomes big time exothermic. And that is absolutely essential. So I always say that Dawkins needs to go and do thermodynamics 101. Um, but that's by the way. But the thing which I want to just show you that which we are interested in doing, if we can get the resources to do it, sorry, is this, that we, we know from Professor Eisner's work, who was a brilliant 
um, experimentalist. I, I really liked working with Professor Eisner because you could ask him quite detailed questions and he would show you the dissections he had made showing that there is a very long tube which comes in and is carrying both the hydroquinone, which is this, and the hydrogen peroxide, and they are not reacting. They are somehow made in this tube, and we don't quite know how it's made. Why am I excited by this? Because at the moment, hydrogen peroxide is produced by a very big process and mass-produced, okay? But it's expensive. The only way you can get it reduced is by the economy of scale. But this beetle is tiny, and it produces hydrogen peroxide, just a tiny amount, just when you need it. Now, that would be brilliant if we could provide mechanisms for providing H2O2 just when we need it, right? Making it just when we need it. Uh, it's very useful for cleaning. It's very useful in medical applications. It, of course, has military applications. I'm aware of that. I don't particularly want it to be used big time for that, but that is the way things go. But hydrogen peroxide is used a lot. And one, one way by which it could be very useful is gas turbines, when, they're, they're in the, when you're trying to save on fuel, right, and you're trying to produce power in land-based gas turbines, you put them onto the very fuel-lean side, okay? But the danger is that the engine will cut out. I've written a paper with prongitis, which shows that if you put hydrogen peroxide into the fuel, you only need a small amount, you can run way into the fuel-lean side. But of course, you don't want to be squirting hydrogen peroxide, which is very dangerous, you know, on its own. So you have to be, it would be great to be able to produce H2O2 just when you need it. So that's my last point here. Nobody quite knows how they work. So this is my next project. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to make it literally work. So my last comment, biblically, the Lord is upholding all things, Hebrews 1 verse 3. Acts 17 says, in him we live and move and have our being. Johann Kepler rightly said, we're just thinking God's thoughts after him. And that verse in Hebrews that I quoted, he upholds all things by the word of his power. I believe there is evidence of design, but I'm not just leaving it at that. I'm saying that inspires me to do research based on that design. And I think rather than stopping research, a creation-based perspective opens up research. All things were made by him, and the verse from Romans 1.20, they, the creation of the world is clearly seen by what he has made. Thank you. <laughs>